We're going on now to section four in the introduction, the scientific and positive meaning of transcendental naivete. So first, um, I'd just like to recall uh, the title of the introduction, A Rigorous Science of Man. And this title um, is a callback to the foreword where Larwell said that um, the problem with philosophy is that it's lacking in rigor. It's not as rigorous as it pretends to be. So there's a, a underlying carelessness and that it's also lacking in humanity. And so what is needed is uh, a science, a new science, the science of ordinary humans, that will be a replacement for philosophy. Sometimes when he's talking more freely, he will um, say that this alternative paradigm or new paradigm is a different sort of philosophy He'll call his position philosophy, but in this book, he's being uh, very didactic. He's studying um, from an absolute opposition, and uh, philosophy is to be uh, seen as inside a single overarching paradigm, the Greco uh, unitary paradigm or tradition and uh, the new um, hypothesis that Lowell is proposing is meant to be uh, science, rigorous and human, uh, as opposed to um, philosophy and so as a, a replacement paradigm. The title of this fourth section the scientific and positive meaning of transcendental naivete takes up uh, what we saw in uh, part three because the whole of the introduction is devoted to uh, what Larouel's uh, conception of science in general is and um, we'll sort of he doesn't go into too many details, but he's giving his general conception of science and um, in a more particular, more detailed way, he's giving his conception of what um, can and must be uh, a science of man, a science of, of humans. And the key uh, characteristic that came up in um, uh, discussing the five uh, uh, characteristics or criteria of demarcation, that is to say, naivete, uh, uh, absoluteness, theoreticity, disc description, and humanity. We saw that the key term was, in fact, the first one, naivete, or um, non-reflexivity, and that uh, was to be understood in terms of um, opening up the closed circle of philosophical uh, reflection and making um, uh, our theory, our theorizing, um, testable, open to uh, confrontation or encounter with the real. So he's going to be spelling out a little more this notion of naivete and um, in, what sense, in what sense it's scientific, in what sense it's positive, and uh, he's going to insist on um, the particular naivete that goes with his um, uh, new transcendental science. 
So he begins um, with a, a, a sort of warning. Any comparison of one science to another, um, in particular of a transcendental science to um, the empirical sciences, is dangerous and really transcends metaphor. So he's doing this all along in the book. He's comparing um, and finding common uh, elements between his transcendental science of humans and the the hard sciences or the soft sciences as well, if you count biology as a soft science, but um, the empirical sciences. And we must remember that he doesn't really consider um, uh, the human sciences as truly scientific or as truly empirical. So that's the guiding thread of the book. And so um, he's in constant danger of um, just falling into um, illusory um, comparisons, or when he succeeds in making a, a comparison, it may just be uh, metaphorical and not, not touch on the essence of um, science. So he continues that one um, uh, tray or criterion that they have in common, transcendental science and the empirical sciences, is a pre-philosophical naivete and a non-reflexivity. And this feature, if it is positive, is in all likelihood essential to their definition as science. So um, here, the two types of science, transcendental science and empirical sciences, are um, as close together as possible. They're to be thought um, in terms of this one criterion, which is naivete, which is to be taken as a synonym for non-reflexivity, and also to be taken um, as the opening of the circle. So that's the sense in which it's um, the meaning is uh, uh, positive. If we treat reflexivity as a predicate, the way the Greek unitary tradition does and philosophy does, and um, we come out in favour of uh, non-reflexivity, the danger is that we may be taking um, non-reflexivity as a predicate too, in which case it's um, uh, just the antithesis to the predicate of um, reflexivity, and so it means something like um, uh, being anti-intellectual, anti so it has either this new agey idea of uh, against the intellect, or this um, uh, theme of um, anti-philosophy of being against the intellect that reflects and um, we're within a, a dualism and so we're within a, a circle of familiar predicates that can swap places but um, that don't um, change the nature of the circle into um, an open uh, figure of thought. So um, this is the opposite, both in the uh, of what Laroel wants to um, uh, set out, both in terms of the structure, it doesn't get us out of the circle, and in terms of the content, that sort of non-reflexivity is the opposite of what Laroel wants, who was um, said in uh, the discussion of um, the third criterion that um, the science of ordinary man and uh, a man or the humans themselves are uh, in essence 
in their real essence are theoretical. So as we said, they're theoretical, they're noetical, and so in that sense they're intellectual unless we're taking the intellect as um, uh, some sort of uh, uh, predicate like a faculty and um, then uh, uh, Laruelle's objections would apply but um, the, I, the negative idea of non-reflexivity is something that he wants to avoid at all, all costs. This book is a hyper-intellectual book, even at the same time as it um, stems from, according to Laruelle, an immediate um, uh, phenomenal experience. So the opening of the circle is um, just developing a theory that is uh, open to encounter to encountering the real and that is testable and uh, Laruel has also told us that this opening of the circle or we're not starting with a circle and then opening it this openness um, this non-circularity is uh, effectuated and maintained by uh, what you'll call later a posture of scientificity and um, by avoiding or refusing or excluding or never getting involved in uh, philosophical operations. So uh, I think this is um, important to bear in mind to understand what follows. I don't think uh, there's any particular operation, intellectual operation like analysis, um, uh, uh, discrimination, synthesis, um, com comparison. Um, that is, in essence, um, philosophical, insofar as um, these operations uh, create a circle that seals one off from the real, they're philosophical, and insofar as they're part and parcel of um, maintaining um, the encounter with the real, they're, they're not philosophical. So that's the first feature. We, um, insofar as we're in the uh, science of ordinary humans, where, um, or insofar as we're in science itself, because this is the um, uh, common uh, tray or, or criterion, we uh, refuse to make use of philosophical operations uh, that neutralize or exclude contact or encounter or reception in the form of uh, passive reception that he talks about uh, earlier um, with the real. Um, that rules out what we called um, uh, constant use of ad hoc adjustments in terms of um, the uh, lower level auxiliary hypotheses to constantly um, uh, deny, rule out, cover over, um, exclude or um, absorb um, any of the, uh, the surprises, the anomalies, the paradoxes that we come across um, when our uh, theory or our science is uh, in active encounter with the real. Um, the same theory can be treated, treated philosophically or scientifically 
depending on on how uh, we handle its uh, inclusion or even its uh, acknowledgement of all these uh, uh, deviant types of um, experience. The second uh, tray, the first is a, a criterion. The first tray is a criterion shared by Transcendental Science and the Empirical Sciences. The second tray um, is a shared characteristic with between transcendental science and one particular empirical science, which is um, quantum physics. So um, he says, even if it is a mere metaphor, it could give philosophers a better way into this project, into this particular project of a science of uh, ordinary man that uh, Larwell is developing in this book. So the first one, naivete, uh, testability, and non-circularity um, is common to both, uh, and the transcendental science and all the empirical sciences. So it's a tray that design designates all the sciences. The second tray, um, uh, quantum mechanics, or quantization, uh, is common just to um, Lowell's transcendental science and um, quantum physics and those parts of um, other uh, domains of uh, other sciences that um, have a physical component that um, uh, is um, treatable in terms of quantum physics. And um, it is quantum mechanics and its foundation in objects, let us say particles, which qualitatively and by definition escape from the earlier modes of visibility and objectivation specific to classical mechanics and thermodynamics. So we've got a, a new type of thought in the uh, developed in the 20th century and constantly confirmed since then. One of the biggest confirmations was the actual discovery of the Higgs boson, which was a, um, a long time coming and was very difficult to um, uh, achieve. But um, there was this feeling that quantum physics may be somehow up in the air in a circular self-validation if it couldn't uh, accomplish this sort of um, uh, testing and, uh, and succeed the test. Uh, Larawell singles out in particular quantum physics new treatment of objects. So remember, he's already discussed the difference between objects, which are inside Greek unitary philosophy, uh, philosophical thought, and are in a vis-a-vis -vis with uh, a, a subject, and um, correspond to um, uh, an understanding in terms of Greco unitary predicates, and on the other hand, objects that are um, directly the real. And he finds an analogy or a metaphor be between this new conception of uh, objects that he's coming up with. He hasn't fully developed yet, and the new conception of objects um, that has been developed by quantum physics. In particular, um, he cites two characteristics by which they escape from 
earlier modes of uh, thought, in particular um, from classical mechanics and thermodynamics, these uh, two uh, trays that quantum mechanics uh, in its very uh, conception uh, suspend are classical visibility and objectivation. So I've already discussed a little just uh, a minute ago this idea of objectivation that um, is a way of uh, treating what Laura Well wants to call objects as totally um, separable from the modes of observation that are deployed to measure them. So observation, there's been lots of uh, uh, strange and unfounded discussion of um, quantum mechanics. Observation in uh, the sense that it is integrated into um, uh, the theory in terms of uh, the collapse of the wave packet or in terms of Heisenberg's uncertainty principle if you observe um, the position the um, speed becomes uh, totally um, or if you totally and precisely observe the position the speed becomes totally indeterminate and vice versa um, uh, this sort of observation doesn't involve subjectivity in the sense of personal subjectivity um, it can be made by any sort of measuring apparatus so nonetheless we do have um, a change in the notion of objectivation and a change in the notion of visibility so um, the super uh, position of quantum states uh, is unobservable so invisible and when you observe it it collapses and um, uh, the predicates that um, characterize the objects may be um, in relations of complementarity and of uncertainty uh, as the uncertainty principle um, affirms that uh, Niels Bohr tried to generalize but anyhow um, the um, sim simultaneous application of two predicates such as position and, and speed or velocity um, uh, is ruled out in t for some pairs of predicates by, by the theory so uh, he goes on to say that at least from the standpoint of habits of thought if not from the standpoint of the type of rigor the introduction of the interval conception of man supposes a qualitative leap in relation to unitary presuppositions and cannot uh, occur within the framework of existing of existing of existing philosophical conceptions. Existing will be good. That will be making existence a predicate. Because um, uh, Larwell, uh, I think, um, is constantly uh, alluding to the, uh, these Greco unitary predicates, and he talks about being as one of them. So he uh, is. Uh, committed to um, uh, disagreeing with the Kantian notion that uh, existence is, is not a predicate. Anyhow, um, we have to change our habits of thought in the science of uh, the ordinary human in a similar way to the change in our habits of thought 
the quantum mechanics requires of us. And um, he's uh, fending off an accusation, uh, sort of like uh, uh, the uh, the Sokal um, hoax and its um, so-called consequences. The French philosophy um, uh, takes on the uh, allures of um, scientific uh, discussion and vocabulary and um, attributes itself a form of scientific rigor that uh, he is just an, an imposture. So uh, Lowell is saying there is a, uh, an analogy, but the type of rigor is uh, totally different. So he's, he's not claiming the same, he's claiming rigor, but he's not claiming the same type of rigor as we find in quantum mechanics. And or in another empirical science. And so he's coming back to his discussion of the leap. Um, we need um, new um, habits of thought. We need to make a qualitative leap um, in relation to unitary presuppositions. This is another thing that um, we mustn't forget. This whole book is a book of pluralism. It's um, uh, devoted to the direct um, experience of the multiple and its dispersions. And um, the one which he goes on about uh, over and over again, the one is perhaps his favorite word, the one is the marker of multiplicity. The one is the marker of the multiple. And so the monist rationalist tradition he calls Greco unitary, uh, one that unifies into uh, totality and that treats its elements as, as units. Um, the one is the marker of uh, the multiple, and so that paradigm is called sometimes unary because um, it is um, outside even the predicate of existence, the predicate of being, and um, is um, uh, regimented, maybe is a, an authoritarian type word, is um, pervaded by and constituted by this one as the marker of the multiple. So we need a leap and um, we need to change our habits and at the same time he says it's um, not a revolution because he thinks a revolution never goes far enough. This is a, a thing that um, uh, many French philosophers um, uh, of a leftist um, heritage who are critical of the way um, Marxism was deployed before. They use um, uh, what I think is a form of uh, word magic. Uh, I uh, disagree with this idea. Revolution, they're not trying a revolution because a revolution is from the definition, well, the etymology of the word, it's um, a circle. It's just um, uh, going round um, one turn of the circle. And so it doesn't really change anything. I think, um, and these are the same people who protest against the regimentation of language and say that usage is more important than Chomskyan or other um, uh, grammatical rules. So I think they should look at the usage of the term revolution and uh, see, we talk about the scientific revolution and I think uh, Lowell will call that um, positive. Um, so I think here he's um, sharing in this um, sort of uh, French uh, style of uh, rejection of 
um, revolution as it has been used in political circles that they sum up in a, um, giving priority to the etymology of the word revolution over um, uh, its usage in, in other contexts. So anyhow, he's saying, no, I don't want a revolution. Um, uh, I want something more difficult, something different and more difficult. And so undoubtedly, this requires psychic efforts that are different and perhaps more difficult than those required by um, a revolution. So the leap, sometimes he says, we're there. We don't need an effort to exit. Um, we are outside as humans. And sometimes he emphasizes the radical break, the leap, the qualitative leap, the efforts that are needed. Um, and just after he, um, uh, at the beginning of the next paragraph, he talks about being resolute. Indeed, it is less a, a matter of questioning, factoring or displacing, objectivating or metaphysical representation than of resolutely thinking uh, outside of it. So there's a leap, there's effort, there's resolution and um, not just one-off resolution, it's resolutely thinking. It's a, um, a durative uh, uh, thinking process. And um, at the end, because I'm only doing um, in this video uh, for uh, subsection one, at the end of this subsection, um, he comes back to the um, problem of changing our, our, our habits. From the perspective of theoretico-psychic habits, there are as many efforts to be made to penetrate the laws of these entities that are individual or um, outside, um, outside the field. So um, here he's um, uh, particularly um, emphasizing, underlining, uh, the idea that um, it's not um, it's not a given that is um, an easy um, let yourself go go with the flow and your um, if you don't uh, bother your head with all these uh, intellectual requirements um, you're in the real. Uh, it's an effort and it's a constant effort. It's a resolute effort of thinking um, outside um, objectivating um, metaphysical representation and questioning, calling into question, arguing, fracturing, breaking it up or displacing it, giving it a sort of um, twist or moving it around to different examples. Uh, all that's okay, but it's, it's not enough. You need to do um, something um, more than sort of laying back and taking pot shots at um, uh, philosophers or at the old ways of thinking. Um, I think here is a, a rejection of something that comes up um, often in um, discussing um, Laruel's um, a new paradigm and um, uh, People quote a saying from Max Planck that um, uh, uh, the old paradigm um, is not displaced by um, so much by argument or evidence or proof as by the fact that um, the old paradigm um, is uh, defended by uh, an older generation and the new paradigm um, becomes accepted when the old generation uh, dies out. So where's the effort in that? There's none. And where is the rejection of um, anthropological um, explanations? 
This is a cheap sociological explanation uh, furnished by uh, a physicist, even worse than a sociologist, a uh, physicist uh, doing uh, pop sociology. And um, it's not true. It's saying, um, it's saying what? That young people are um, less conservative intellectually than old people, um, when in fact uh, the people who have done the most um, work in changing our thought were, were not um, uh, young students in the academy. And in fact, um, from experience, I can tell you uh, that there is nothing more conformist than young people. Their radicality, their nonconformism, is uh, uh, their transgression is hypercoded, and um, it's going to take them a lot of time and a lot of effort to um, uh, get into a new paradigm that has been constructed by um, uh, older people or um, to generate their, um, uh, their own new paradigm. It's not going to come like that from uh, uh, no effort and the leap required um, it's not a, a punctual leap, uh, um, you just see something in a new way. You're going to have to be resolute in your thinking outside of um, the presuppositions. Lowell goes on to say um, that you have to resolutely think outside of um, objectivating metaphysical representation without ever giving oneself objects, objects. But he adds that that doesn't mean you don't have objects, you just don't have objects. But it's objects are not objects, that is, realities slightly affected by transcendence. Uh, sounds funny. Um, You probably do have objects that are very much affected by transcendence and they're easy to get rid of. So we're back to the effort that even when your objects are um, the product of this questioning, fracturing, dis displacing, de deconstructing and so on, um, and you've got, written, got rid of most of um, the tr transcendent um, presuppositions that you can uh, um, ex isolate or detect, as long as there's even a tiny, tiny bit of um, uh, uh, transcendence, you, you still haven't made the leap. You're in objects and not objects. So um, objects in that world sense are totally outside the Greek unitary grid. And I want to um, give a an example of a supposedly revolutionary uh, paradigm, object-oriented ontology, that um, is the pure um, uh, distillation of everything that Larwell is uh, working to um, get away from. So I'm going to quote from uh, Graham Har Harmon's book, the uh, quadruple object because um, Harmon, in appearance, he starts um, off with a shared value, a value that he shares with um, uh, Lowell, naivete. But his idea of um, uh, naivete is not breaking outside uh, of the philosophical circle with, um, with great effort. His idea of um, naivete is just um, looking around. Somebody might say uh, gawking and goggling. Um, the introduction begins. Instead of beginning with radical doubt, we start from naivete. 
what philosophy shares with the lives of scientists, bankers, and animals is that they are all concerned um, with objects. So naivete is directly linked with um, straight away with objects. Uh, the introduction is only two pages, and um, then for the first chapter, undermining and overmining. He begins uh, once again uh, with naivete. Once we begin from naivete rather than doubt, objects immediately take centre stage. On my desk are pens, eyeglasses, an expired uh, American passport. Each of these has numerous qualities, that is to say predicates, and can be turned to reveal different surfaces and uses. Furthermore, each object is a unified thing. And it goes on to insist on this idea, paragraph two, all are unified objects. Objects are units. And uh, the naive statement, the naive standpoint, uh, makes no initial claim as to which of these objects is real or unreal. So this is the... Um, opposite of uh, uh, Larawell's uh, method and, and science. Um, you just um, you can't just uh, look around you and uh, look at the empirical given. For uh, Larawell, we've seen uh, this sort of empirical given is totally um, pervaded by and uh, constructed by the encyclopedia of known uh, predicates that designate the known qualities that could be um, uh, attributed to objects. And this idea um, that they're um, unitary, that they're units, is um, the um, quintessence of the Greco uh, unitary uh, tradition. So we're not, um, with Larawell, we're not looking at um, this sort of um, uh, I don't even want to call it em empirical naivete. I, what I want to call it is um, hypocritical naivete because in the course of the book, while appealing to this naive uh, um, perception of uh, objects, Harmon will ultimately conclude that the central objects that we uh, see or, or, or hear or smell or, or touch or taste are unreal and that behind them there are uh, the real objects. So um, many people don't um, uh, pick up on uh, the, um, the second stage, uh, the second level fact that Yes, we can stop and look around and see that we're surrounded by objects, but that's already being philosophically conditioned to see the world in terms of objects. But that's um, all of that's unreal for object-oriented ontology. Only the real objects, as the name suggests, are real. So um, it's a, a, a pseudo, a, a, a pseudo uh, a naivete that um, is ultimately um, denounced in a um, covered up sort of way, is ultimately uh, deconstructed by the whole argument of object-oriented ontology. So uh, Lowell is um, uh, not even beginning with that. All those are objects and we need something else entirely that we um, by the um, transcendental transformation of the meaning of words, because um, Lowell is obliged to use um, the word, sometimes at least, the words of ordinary language, and he'll give them a totally different meaning. And uh, this different meaning is the meaning of uh, um, objects, and if we have trouble uh, uh, grasping 
what Lowell means by objects. Um, he gestures um, at quantum theory, quantum mechanics, and the idea um, of, uh, in particular, the rejection or the suspension of objectivation and of uh, visibility as um, the sorts of traits that his uh, thought of objects shares with um, quantum mechanics. These are individuals, the objects, no, not the objects, the objects. These are individuals defined by their transcendental immanence alone and by the experiences they have in their relations with the world or authorities. So the objects, no hyphen objects, are, um, are subjects. And so there's no vis-a-vis. -vis. They're subjects of experience and um, unlike unitary or authoritarian thought, individual or minoritarian thought moves in the utterly positive sphere, neglected by philosophy, of a radical, invisible, perhaps even unconscious, that um, would be nothing but subject, without in addition being transcendent or objective. So um, the objects, no hyphen, are um, purely subjective. They're positive. So unfortunately, to um, uh, uh, denote a positivity, sometimes we must use uh, negative prefixes. So radical invisible, we have invisible, and we have unconscious. We put it once in um, quotation, scare quotes, and once um, not, because um, when it's not in scare quotes, he's redefining it as nothing but subject. Nothing but. We've got, a once again, a negative-looking um, expression. But the, um, the invisible, the unconscious, the nothing but subject are negative in form only. So we're used to um, uh, Laruel's uh, use of um, markers like the um, parentheses around of or, or uh, to uh, um, to indicate that the conceptual syntax is different from the linguistic sy syntax. Here he uses the scare quotes or the the qualifications or the sort of um, returning formulas of nothing but to indicate that it's positive but it's outside um, the transcendent paradigm. It's in the uh, paradigm of imminence um, that he's developing in, in the book. So the semantics of these terms are positive, even when um, that's what he says. I think we can um, understand uh, that that's a reasonable thing to say, that the semantics are positive, despite the uh, negative um, formation or appearance of the expressions it has to use to designate them. Um, if we look at uh, object-oriented ontology, it's um, uh, a doubly transcendent paradigm. It's um, transcendent in that we look around and we see objects, and these are, in fact, um, defined, constituted um, by the Greco unitary uh, paradigm, which is under the dominance of transcendence. And secondly, these objects are not even the real objects. 
and we have a transcendent object um, behind or uh, under um, the the sensual objects. So um, once again, uh, Lowell talks about an unconscious that would be nothing but subject. The unconscious is the min minoritarian thought, not the personal unconscious. Nothing but subject, um, and without being transcendent or um, uh, objective or constituent of the subject. So he's um, putting forward the human and so the subject of science as pure subject, nothing but subject. So this calls for a sort of um, recentering on his argument. This is a different um, paradigm, not a supplementary variation on the unitary paradigm. So whereas object-oriented ontology is working within the same old um, uh, uh, Greco unitary program and just uh, doing a, a variation on that type of thought, a modern day, uh, latter day variation, um, Lowell is proposing a whole new paradigm. The type of leap involved, the type of conversion of thought is radically different, is radically more difficult. It requires radically more effort than just uh, looking around and saying, oh yes, things, uh, everything I see is an object and um, uh, so I've gone beyond all philosophy. Philosophy hasn't seen that. So um, after you have to think a little and read uh, uh, Harman's books, but the effort, the noetic effort, the intellectual effort, uh, the psychic effort as well, uh, is all uh, are all far less than the effort involved in um, uh, leaping into and resolutely thinking in terms of a new paradigm. What we call the minoritarian paradigm entails the abandonment of Greek ontological habits and their deconstructions. So um, old style ontology that we've tried to, um, or so not, not us, not you or, uh, listening to me or, or, or me, but the old on, ontological habits um, that have undergone a, a renewed existence uh, in um, recent times and their deconstructions are still moving in the Greco unitary circle. We need something um, stronger, more difficult than uh, deconstruction. So the minoritarian paradigm opens a field of realities that have been absolutely hidden since the origin of philosophy. There is taking on um, uh, uh, biblical um, uh, Tones, hidden since the origin, absolutely hidden since the origin of philosophy. I wonder if he's having a dig at uh, René Girard, who in one of his books adopts the title, uh, uh, Things Hidden uh, Since the Origin of the World. So um, nonetheless, he's being serious, except there's a problem that he's going to resolve. The minoritarian paradigm opens a field of realities that have been hidden and then um, a little later at the bottom of page 16 he says it no longer obeys the laws of opening and closing the always unitary laws of a field or a body or a continent or an epoch or an episteme, etc. I would argue that the uh, etc. includes not um, uh, paradigm as well. So he's at least twice and I think maybe even um, uh, three times uh, undermining his own claim. 
the claim is the new paradigm, the minoritarian um, uh, paradigm, opens a new field of realities, of human uh, reality. And um, straight away, he rejects the um, image, the metaphor and the model of opening and closing. And he rejects the um, um, uh, image of the field. And I would argue he's also rejecting the idea of a paradigm um, as uh, we could say uh, metaphysical or philosophical as monistic falling under unitary laws. So there's this dif difficulty of um, uh, having to use words as philosophical predicates and give them a new usage. So you're um, going to have to constantly undermine the potential philosophical usage of your vocabulary on the go as you as you go along you need to say it's a new paradigm but that suggests a sort of binary dualistic um, uh, absolute separation what he calls uh, uh, a cordoning off and we saw in uh, the last video the synthesis of, of science and demarcation that um, he doesn't mean uh, exactly that and we're going to have to unify um, what we're discussing into into objects that's part of the Greek unitary logic of, uh, of language of its syntax and semantics so we're going to unify things in terms of for example uh, a field that you can cordon off and open or close the access to um, this is where uh, he says after having saying that the minor minoritarian program opens a field of realities Still on page 16, but a little further down. It's not at all a transcendental field of individuals that is proposed here, like a new transcendent hint interworld. So uh, an indirect um, uh, reference to, uh, to, to Nietzsche and Nietzsche's critique of the, of the afterworld or of the, the hinterworld of um, Christian theology. So it's um, not a transcendental field of individuals, but a dispersion of purely transcendental rather than transcendent, transcendent individuals. So this is the thing we have to keep in mind all the time. Um, once again, we can look at um, object-oriented ontology. The objects are transcendent. Even people are um, transcendent. Our ordinary uh, perception of ourselves is sensual. And I, I think object-oriented ontology um, comes up w with a problem that, strictly speaking, you can't even count objects. You can't even count um, uh, real objects. So you can't even count real persons and say uh, real individuals in the ontological sense and say how many there are. So that's a problem for them. I'm not going to worry about it, about that. Um, Lara Wells' idea is he's not talking about um, transcendent individuals, but he's talking about transcendental individuals. And they're um, as transcendental uh, they're both the condition and the real of our experience. So they're real conditions. They're the essence of uh, the individual as real. And so you don't have to go um, uh, 
through chains of uh, reasoning uh, to to figure out that they're there behind the central appearance and how to um, get at them in some sort of cognitive grasp. That's a, another problem for object-oriented ontology. Um, uh, denotation is a linguistic relation and the real um, uh, is outside of all relation. So um, the real the real objects cannot come uh, within cognitive grasp and that leads so can't even come within linguistic grasp if you understand linguistic grasp in terms of uh, denotation and that's why uh, Harmon comes up with the idea well yes you can't denote them but you can allude to them this idea of um, uh, allusion is um, a way of um, maintaining a cognitive relation to a transcendent object whose very def definition as transcendent within the system is a strong, a, a hyper strong notion of transcendence that uh, prohibits all relation. So if you can't denote, you can't uh, allude to either. Um, or um, as I think Frank Ramsey said of um, uh, Wittgenstein's um, type of facts, of linguistic facts that he was talking about um, uh, in the Tractatus, uh, if you can't say it, you can't whistle it either. So um, uh, object-oriented ontology um, tries to whistle what it can't say and nonetheless uh, even the whistling is uh, bereft of any relation to the real. So um, that's what happens when uh, you're attempting, I suppose uh, Lara Well would say, that's what happens when you're attempting a revolution within the Greco unitary paradigm instead of uh, leaping out into a, a radically new uh, paradigm. You're, you're not putting in the effort necessary to um, create uh, or set up or maintain or resolutely follow um, a new paradigm. So from the perspective of theoretico-psychic habits, there are as many efforts to be made to penetrate the laws of these entities that are individual or outside the field, with hyphens between the three, word, uh, between the three words outside the field, equals outside being, absolutely unnoticed by ontology. So there are as many efforts to be made to penetrate the laws of these entities as there are to penetrate the domain of particles in the um, uh, quantum sense. So uh, we have to learn to think differently. And in particular, we have to learn to think outside being. And that is going to require an effort that takes us uh, beyond what um, much of the philosophical tradition has um, put forward as the fundamental con concepts of the framework. So when he talks about being, he's not just talking about the ordinary ontology of the past, he's also talking about Heidegger, and he's also talking about um, uh, Deleuze, uh, who despite the use of a pluralist paradigm, um, at least in earlier work like Difference and re Repetition, reunifies the whole with this doctrine of the university of, of being. So I think when Lowell is talking about being as a philosophical predicate, he's not thinking just about these philosophies that are dis, uh, distant in time, but about um, the philosophies 
that are closest at home for him, just as I try to use um, uh, object-oriented ontology because it's um, a philosophy that is close to home, at least in terms uh, of uh, its c contemporary uh, fashion. Um, and so uh, these uh, predicates, including being that Lowell is uh, uh, getting away from, are something that require constant um, uh, resolute uh, thinking to maintain ourselves outside of.